so we'll go ahead and get going right away. Uh, title of mine is this looks fishy. So this is actually a patient that Brian Stagg saw originally, and I might point out, immediately diagnosed. So he's the first person to diagnose this patient. Um, and then I followed up with him over at Children's. So it was an eight-year-old boy who, I'll kind of give you his sort of HPI. Uh, he originally had double, he was chief complaint with double vision and dilated pupils. His history on the 16th of December, he had some fever and vomiting. He went to see his primary care doctor a few days later and said he's back on the viral of the respiratory. Gave him some decongestant medicine. Two days later, went back to his PCP because he'd woken up with bilateral dilated eyes and had a bunch of hives. And so they started Benadryl to try to help with the hives, which did help with the hives with the number of bilateral dilated pupils. Um, the next day, started to have copia, and so it was went into the ER with the copia as well as bilateral dilated eyes. Um, the ER saw him and told him that they thought it was most likely an allergic reaction, recommended stopping all the medications. Um, the fact that they didn't know the copia and the dilated eyes. On the 26th, nothing had improved by that point, so mom brought him back in, um, still with dilated eyes, still with bilateral double vision, and then also having some mild eye pain with eye movements. And um, he had some vomiting having a little bit of unsteadiness on his feet and very stuff. But otherwise, no other neurologic symptoms for his patients. Past medical history, he's very healthy kid, he's uh, met all these sort of early milestones for his upsetting his vaccinations, so never had previous surgery, no ocular history. Did have a sister with strabismus, uh, and some mild amphibia. He lived at home with his mom, grandparents, three siblings, um, and all of his siblings were also sick with sort of some similar other respiratory symptoms with the exception of Um, medications, he was, at the time of being seen in the ER, by us, he was on Benadryl every about four to six hours for the past four days, so he didn't have any medications. He was alert and oriented, his vision was 20-30, they had bilateral dilated pupils, eight millimeters, that were non reactive to light or to accommodation, high and full computational field, and then limitation of his extra movements. Most notably, look uh, most profoundly in a deduction of his right eye and a deduction of his left eye. Um, and then also with the most preservation of the direction in the past in this interactive infection. So this is pictures taken from a video. So they don't totally track how far they actually got, but it gives you sort of a good idea. His right eye, you can see, has very limited a deduction, but his a deduction is fairly good. Um, and he was able to project better than that. Uh, and then similarly here, again, he can a deduct very well with his left eye. The rest of his ocular exam was relatively unremarkable. So he had a normal perineal clunge going over to his chamber. Obviously, his iris um, was dilated, um, and his nose was clear. He had a normal dilated face. His neurologic exam, uh, this was mostly actually, this was partially done by us, but then also rechecked by the neurologist and so also saw this patient. Um, and of note, he had an absent propensity. Normal strength, normal sensation. They felt like his coordination was appropriate for his age, and, but he did have a positive drum merge where he was sort of falling back, even without his eyes closed, and with his eyes closed as well. He had some unsteadiness, but no. So we went to the collegiate for the gifts that were not there. Yes, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, and then <laughs> great question. <laughs> Would you like me to put up a list or do you want to ask some people? 
that this patient had done in normal, basically a normal patient. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Excellent. So their laboratory work, his laboratory work, of course, basically is completely normal, um, including thyroid, ESR, CRP. Uh, he had a perineoplastic panel that was sent off, which is anti-GP1B, which we'll talk about later. He had a CT that showed maxillary sinus disease, um, but no cavernous sinus problems or intracranial uh, issues. He had a lumbar puncture to sort of look at infectious ideologies, which it was negative for all PCRs for EBD, HSV, VZD, and normal ACE and normal clinical 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 not present. And then besides the paranasal sinus disease, you can really have any other abnormalities on the PCR. His hospital course, so he was seen initially from 9 to 26. On the 28th, he continued to have internal external paraplegia. Neurology was concerned that he was maybe having some worsening instability and some diminishment of his reflexes, which had previously been normal. So he initiated IVIG therapy. And then he was discharged on the 31st. He had slight improvement in his balance, but sort of persistent internal and external paraplegia. And his sort of running diagnosis at that point was that there probably was probably a Miller Fisher type syndrome. Follow-up, he's followed up with Dr. Kennard, and basically a month after his onset, his visual acuity was 2020, he still had bilateral and dilated pupils on the right of formation. His motility exam had improved. Um, his anti-GP1B had finally come back positive two and a half weeks later, so that was good. Um, and then interesting, one of the things that Dr. Kennard had read up about and did some testing on was a lot of times his patients will have super sensitivity to pilot carpet. So you can see he's still fairly dilated with light, Very profoundly, actually, within like five or ten minutes. This was taken at 30 minutes. Had a substantial change in his pupil size. Um, his pupils weren't bothering him in terms of positive light sensitivity. Is one of the things that we had. talked about was you know he was having a lot of light sensitivity problems. He did that just to get to the actual. But he was not bothered by his pupils. So that's the dilute kind of thing. I uh, had a follow up again a uh, month after that. He still had somewhat persistent dilated pupils that were beginning to react slightly um, and had, again, improvement in these extra upper movements with continued limitation of mm -hmm. deduction for resolution of all other extra upper movements. And at this point, subjectively, his double vision was mostly resolved and he probably just sort of trained himself a little bit to this thing. So the clinical questions that sort of came up for me was, hey, what is this? Um, and these were also questions that obviously I thought parents would have and I thought would be useful for looking in the literature. Um, will his double vision and dilated pupils improve? How long will it have each of those things and will this happen again? So sort of looking at things, Miller Fisher syndrome. So it's a variant of Guillain Barre. It's sort of classically associated with these three findings, ataxia, interflexia, and external ophthalmoplegia. Um, and you can kind of see the sort of days of onset. Ataxia and external ophthalmoplegia typically come around about the same time. So um, and they sort of recover around will have recovery within a six month period, um, often within the first three to four months. The areflexia is sort of the longest to, to, to stick around and sometimes may actually be persistent when it doesn't end with the bottom of the patient. Um, just sort of a quick overview of the time course. In most cases, patients have an anti uh, preceding URI, um, most clinical, looking at all those sort of different case studies and series, anywhere between 56 and 76 patients usually do, um, they have the classic triad approximately a week after they have their preceding URI, and then um, neurologic symptoms uh, sort of begin to recover about two weeks and take about six months to recover. These are kind of the three big case studies that I found that were out there. So EDO is the most recent one uh, that has the most numbers on it. And, and as you can see, again, the important thing was all three of these sort of had the classic ataxia, a reflexing external occlusion, and these are just sort of associated things. Um, of note, you can see that uh, antecedent URI is present about three fourths of these patients, so that's very common. A lot of them actually will have some degree of ptosis associated with it, which our patient did not necessarily. Uh, and then internal occlusion, which our patient did have, can actually be seen in about a third or four percent of cases. Uh, and then a lot of times there is some other sort of systemic or bulb on the in terms 
terms of looking at internal ophthalmic fusion, which our patient has, there are a number of case reports in series with this. Um, and there's been demonstration of pilot carbon super sensitivity as soon as three months or three days post the development of the dilated pupils. The important things for sort of differentiating between the 80s is obviously the associated symptoms, which in the 80s we should be able to have, but then you also should have a lack of hand support and a lack of sexual quality to the 80s. Um, and again, usually three weeks, four months, sort of in alignment with the other neurologic symptoms for recovery. The diagnostic workup, the big thing is this anti There are some people in some centers who will, who will sort of test for um, predisposing infections that have been associated with anti gp one b uh, It's not necessarily necessary. It doesn't really affect the treatment of the outcome for the patient, per se, uh, but can provide some answers to the um, And then in a range of percent, depending on the study you that, some people will have an element of protein that they should not have that, and they usually will have a, they should have a normal protein. Um, with regards to treatment, the biggest thing that I took away from it, you know, almost universally, this is a process that people recover on their own within a three to six month period. There is some literature, because this is a variant of beyond the and there's been a lot of randomized control studies demonstrating the efficacy of IVIG in beyond the uh, There has been a number of people who have tried it with Miller Fisher syndrome. Sort of the difference between the fact is that with Miller Fisher, universally, they have always recover. And so, there's a lot of people who feel that exposing that your patient to IVIG or cosmic crisis in a uh, situation that's going to come up with an unnecessary risk. Um, though there's been a few sort of anecdotal case reports of patients having quicker improvement than those that have this. With regards to prognosis, there's been a lot of looking at different risk factors and associations, and I've never really found anything that has an effect in terms of the outcome. Um, and most patients have little or no disability in six months. Recurrence was another issue that the mom was asking about. And that mom was at. So there's um, one study that looked at recurrence in adults, about 28, they had 28 patients that have had 70 episodes. Uh, so most of them had one recurrence, so a few people who had multiple, multiple recurrences. And again, similarly, usually these were associated with a similar rate of uh, antecedent infection. And then there was only two case reports of recurrence in children, uh, sort of a similar age range. They had a preceding febrile illness, both of them. And actually, both of these were treated with IVIG when they were hurt and didn't have a response. And they actually did full steroid therapy and had a very good response to full therapy and um, recurrence. Um, in terms of pathogenesis, so it's thought to be that this could be related to sort of molecular mimicry, which Brian kind of talked about in the last one. Um, but this these gangliosides or glycosphingolipins are located on the plasma membrane and seem to be sort of universally found more prominently in the cranial nerves that supply the extraocular movements. Um, some increasing that with neuromuscular junction and then some of the sensory neurons as well. And some of the glycopolysaccharides that are associated with some of the associated infections seem to have a great deal of mimicry between those two. And so there seems to be a cross reaction that then leads to there have been tighter studies that have shown with clinical presentation that tighter or higher or even <coughs> as the clinical presentation improves the tighter as well. Um, you can see these same antibodies in the umbrella, although there's a lot less frequently, up to 95% though of more efficient patients will have it. Acute ophthalmoplegia was actually sort of another thing that was on the differential here, which is basically Miller Fisher without the ataxia and the reflexia, which uh, neurology felt he had sort of forward or unknown the prevalence of So my sort of conclusions were that it, uh, these antibodies can cause sort of a spectrum of syndromes, but in particular, if you have a patient that has a combination of ataxia, ophthalmoplegia, and aphoplexia, something that you should consider in differential for both kids and adults. Uh, it's typically self-resolving and usually it's not necessary. Do you have any questions? Do you think The good thing about the 
triple threat in our ophthalmology right now. So this is a patient that presented to Dr. Katz's general ophthalmology clinic. I think saw the correct general ophthalmologist that did. Came in with a history of blurred vision, uh, eye strain, and kind of vision symptoms of blurred vision. So based on, I'm going to briefly go through a few of these, and then I'll talk about our patient profile. Uh, carcinoma is meningitis. It is basically when it's malignant spread to the meninges that can happen through, uh, again, a few different ways. Happens not too commonly.
really differentiate this from carcinoma meningitis, CSF should have a negative psychology. 